We're here on the London show today as part of our grand co-plater experience. And we just saw the movie Rogue One, a Star Wars story. And so naturally, that's all we can think about. Well, this isn't just any London show. This is our Life Day special. Oh, of course. Yes. The Life Day special, considering the season, that yeah, time of the year. It's that time of year again. Time for awkward Wookiee family moments. Yes. Cooking shows. Radio kits, or is that an electronics kit? It was an electronics thing. Does anybody know? And uh, singing Princess Leia. Creepy VR tech. Almost as awkward as what we saw in Rogue One. (laughs) It wasn't awkward so much as it was just uncanny. Yes. But anyway, enough with the digressing. I can't believe Jar Jar saved everyone. I know. Where did that even come from? He just came swinging in on a vine, doing the Tarzan yell. That's Chewie's job. But, uh, I, yeah, I thought everyone was going to die, but then Jar Jar showed up. Okay, just a heads up, this is going to be a spoilerific review. Yeah, if you haven't seen Rogue One, which by now is kind of silly, um, because everyone should have seen it, <laughs> honestly, then you're lost. But yes, trigger word, spoilers. Get off the fence and go watch it. So with that in mind, uh, let's talk about what we thought they did well. And we we'd kind of talked about this earlier, especially just after seeing the film. Some of the things that we really liked. And the first thing I'll bring up is that it didn't suffer from backstory pitfalls or backstory-itis. Yeah, yeah. It, um, it introduces a lot of characters and it gives you, for some of them, just uh, one or two lines of backstory. And that's really all, all you need. Yeah. Yeah, the, the really good example I liked was the pilot that defected. You don't see him doing the defecting. You just hear, oh, a pilot defected and he's bringing a message to the rebel. And then you see him. And then instead of wasting time on his backstory, you just he gets into the group and you see him doing things and you, you learn about his personality that way. And I thought that was really good. It assumed that the audience was intelligent enough to infer things. Yes. I was afraid the girl would have a lot more backstory, but they actually gave more in the preview than in the actual movie, I think. Oh, yeah. Jin's character. Uh-huh. Jin or so. Yeah, I think they did just the right amount with her. Uh-huh. Like, we got a bit at the beginning and a little bit of extra bits here and there, but mostly it was just focused on the story it was trying to tell. Yeah, that's what we noticed. It jumps right into the story. Yeah, I talked to another friend who'd watched it, and they said that the um, the pacing was a little off at the beginning, going straight into the um, the story. But I thought that that was okay. Yeah, I loved that. I thought, oh, good, no dawdling around. Let's get going. Yeah, the scene on Iceland planet. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was just the right amount of length to show who the major players were to kind of introduce the MacGuffin. Here's the scientist character. Here's the big baddie coming to get him. And here's Jin having a traumatic childhood that'll feed into her character development. Oh, yeah, I like that bad guy that they had. Yes. Director, what's his name? I'm going to call him the director for the rest of the interview. <laughs> the director. The director. Yeah, he was Krennic? a really good villain. I want to say Director Critic. 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 Critic Shaw. <laughs> I, I don't know. Some, something. Oh my gosh. <laughs> he was named after that fortress from Mistborn. Oh. I caught your reference, Amy. Thank we, you. we all did, except for the listener because they haven't read it. Anyways, back to Star Wars. That's a whole another tangent. <laughs> um, yeah, he was a really good antagonist. He was really fleshed out. He wasn't just another um, Empire suit. And so he had a personal connection with the protagonist. Yes. Uh huh. Well, and he had um, he had an arc. He had yeah, he had goals and motivations. Uh, it wasn't just ah ha ha, let's kill the good guys. It was uh, him I'm fighting. I'm still to- in charge. Yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> he was fighting to keep his job as director of the Death Star. He fought so hard. He went toe to toe with Darth Vader. Pretty much. And even though he was nervous, he still did it. <laughs> So I'm still in charge. <laughs> uh, everything they did with the Empire, I loved. Yeah, they really did great. Not just on the visuals, but the 
different imperial officers and troopers running around doing stuff and you had some old classic stuff in there classic stormtroopers classic tie fighters classic star destroyers yeah and they didn't they didn't try to explain it or justify it like how come we have spaceships but we don't have cameras or or well i guess they have cameras but like security cameras oh like why wasn't there enough security to keep them out yeah but you don't really think about it too much or at least i didn't no. yeah, i didn't either You're just so caught up in what's going on but yeah they depicted the empire from the fourth movie as accurately as possible yeah it felt like it was an, a natural flow into that next movie a new hope it felt like it was part of the same um timeline mm -hmm. everything looked right everything felt right and it was just it was just a lot of fun well yeah by the end of it i was i was so happy <laughs> i mean everyone died but i was still very happy <laughs> well and i i I'd mentioned that before that I kind of got the vibe that um, we knew that Princess Leia had gotten the plans. And that she was the only one that had them. Yeah, and so you had to assume, okay, the Empire had taken care of the people who had stolen them. Yeah, like or, Leia was the last loose end they had to tie up in this security breach. Yeah, and so you kind of went in knowing they're all going to die or at least all get captured and imprisoned. And so that, that wasn't a horrible surprise. It was just a natural flow but yeah something you had said that w i really agreed with is it almost felt more like a star wars movie than the force awakens did yeah and the force awakens was still really good and it, it was nice having um a lot of the original cast back to round things off mm -hmm. yeah but the force awakens was the first movie in a trilogy yeah and so, so it was it, working harder it was trying to set a bunch of things up yeah it's it's saying goodbye to the old and saying hello to the new whereas this one was like hello to all of the old Okay, so with The Force Awakens, I loved it, but I feel like I have to not apologize for it, but definitely if people say they didn't like it, I can give that to them, say, okay, this isn't for everyone. But if there's anyone who doesn't like Rogue One, I'm going to call him an idiot. <laughs> It's kind of a, that level above The Force Awakens in that regard. Well, it's just an overall really good movie. Mm -hmm. And it's a good Star Wars movie because it has all the right elements and it plays them all to just the right amount. Well, and it does it the right way, too. It isn't tons of... Well, okay, it is tons of fan pandering. Oh, my goodness. Let's, let's talk a moment about the fan service. Yes, the fans. The one that everybody will know right off the bat is obviously the Peter Cushing knockoff. <laughs> The Grand Moff Tarkin. I was really hoping he would be in that, though. I didn't know how they would put him in if they'd get a new actor, but I really wanted him to be in it. Yeah, that was something I thought, too. They introduced the, the main antagonist, and I thought, okay, he's going to be the obvious Peter Cushing um, shoe in because they can't have him in. And then they totally did! <laughs> and they play the two off each other, and it's beautiful. There's going to be a lot of people who are going to be a little weirded out by the CGI. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know it's CGI, but it's really good CGI. Well, you get lost in the character, so you're willing to forgive it. I actually went in thinking they would get look-alike actors That's instead what of I trying too. to CGI it. So I went through most of the movie thinking is that CGI or is that a real person? They look an awful <laughs> lot like the original so that's a great look alike the moment i saw him i knew it was cgi because it was it was it's not as bad as leia's uncanny valley yeah. but it was in there <laughs> but you you quickly forgive it because she, oh this is grandma of turk and he's doing what he does best they got the voice it's yeah they got the voice down it felt like him and that really sold it and maybe they could have done the same with leia's character i mean all she really got was like a three second cameo there at the end to tie it all into a new hope you think with for three seconds they could have spent longer on the cgi <laughs> Well, they, they'd already, you know, the whole rest of the movie blown their CGI budget. I guess. But while we're still on the topic of fan service, they had most of the uh, the same stuff from the trench run in A New Hope with this. Even though it wasn't a trench run, you have all of those kind of alike characters and some that were actually from A New Hope. Yeah. yeah. Just kind of copy-pasted in. That was, that was pretty good. It was kind of neat to hear them flying around shooting stuff. And they did a really good job on the graphics. I enjoyed watching those X-Wing dogfights a lot. Oh, the yeah. space battle was terrific. Yeah, they had a lot of old fan service stuff in, but then they also introduced some new stuff. And I guess that um, hammerhead ship that they used to 
shove the two Star Destroyers together. Apparently that's um, from the Expanded Universe, I think a video game. So a lot of people were really excited to see that ship in there. Oh, oh that's cool. Yeah, I thought that was a pretty cool ship. It's like, why don't they have that more? <laughs> yeah, I guess talking to a couple of my friends, they said there was a lot of graphics and references to the uh, the old 90s video games. Okay. And some of the comic books that I guess really appealed to a, a broad audience. So they kind of covered all the Star Wars niches. Well, yeah, they've got all this expanded universe lore to work with. It's None of it's canon, but they can still use it. Oh, I guess the guy that took care of Jin with the robot feet, I guess he was a character that shows up in the Clone Wars and Star Wars Rebels. Really? Uh-huh. Oh. So he's an expanded universe character. I felt like there was somebody else, but I can't remember off the top of my head. They're, they're trying to make it all cohesive now, trying to undo what George Lucas just willy-nilly said. Sure, that can be canon. Sure, that can be canon. <laughs> well, they're doing it really well. They are. And if uh, they keep doing what they did with this first anthology film, I think Disney's going to make a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, we knew they were going to, as it was, just slapping Star Wars onto it, but uh, they're going to earn it. Yeah, it seems like they're putting legitimate effort into it. They have a lot of respect for the IP. While it is a cash grab for them, they're putting it's soul into it. It's a respectful cash grab. Yes. I feel like they've taken a lot of the ideology that Pixar had in its early days, that kind of quality creativism. Okay. Creativity. I feel like uh, Pixar was gave itself standards, and uh, Disney's assimilating that. Say what you will about their animated sequels and whatnot, but you have to give them credit for what they're doing in the expanded film franchises they own. Yeah. Speaking of animated sequels, what did you think of that Cars 3 trailer? <laughs> <laughs> that that would have been a talk of the internet for a couple of weeks before we went to see yeah. that movie. Yeah. I hadn't actually seen the trailer, but I'd heard people talking about it. To be honest, I think the trailer's doing exactly what it was supposed to, and that was... Get people talking about yeah, it. Uh -huh. Generate hype so that Cars isn't stale anymore. This is Cars we're talking about. <laughs> it's gritty and dark. <laughs> Yeah, they didn't even flash the title because it's so well branded by this point. This is going to be the Dark Knight of the Cars movies. <laughs> I think uh, they wanted to, what we're doing right now to happen, and that's for us to be talking about it. Otherwise, would we be talking about Cars 3? No, we wouldn't. Don't worry, I'll cut this out. Okay, going back to Rogue One. There was something else we talked about that went really well, and that was... Was it the protagonist syndrome? Yeah, protagonist you syndrome. You talk more about that. Okay, so this is the idea, and you see this so much in action movies these days, that the protagonist is just constantly dodging and surviving certain death situations, and there's no reason they should be surviving for so long, because the only reason is they're the protagonist. Yeah, they get away with crap. Yeah, they get away with crap. And a really good example is actually a Star Wars A New Hope, okay. where they show up on the Death Star, and they just walk around, and I mean, they're wearing the Stormtrooper outfits, but later on, and they're just kind of running the halls and yeah, shooting Yeah, they go to them. the high-security prison and just bust Leia out. Oh, we didn't even know you were here, <laughs> but okay. I mean, it's still a lot of fun, but that's a classic example of protagonist syndrome. They get away with bloody murder on the Death Star because they're, they're the protagonists. Well, we never thought of it as getting away with bloody murder until watching Rogue One, yeah. where they can't get away with bloody murder. Yeah, in Rogue One, you, you get the sense that everything they do has to be earned, worked for, and there's a lot of risk on the line. Well, and the, the Empire, it feels so powerful oh, and yeah, so the, cruel. The Empire seems actually competent and capable. Yeah, and formidable. Like, uh -huh. like the stormtroopers could actually hit you. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's a good point. When they were fighting in that one city that was going to get blown up by the Death Star, it felt like the stormtroopers could actually kill. They weren't stereotyped stormtroopers. Yeah. Just, oh no, I'm getting killed. Oh, I can't, why can't I hit anything? Um, but And then when the characters start dropping like flies, it feels... It makes sense. It makes <laughs> sense. Yes, that was the other thing we talked about was that um, they didn't have death for death's sake uh-huh or there's some movies and things where someone dies and it's like a lucky shot or something they've survived far worse things than this but it's time for them to die so oh i got unlucky now or that uh oh we need to be edgy so we're gonna have a, a character a, a closely known character die because we're edgy or a character suddenly gets stupid just so they can die uh -huh. yeah you and need... it didn't feel that way at all with this. Yeah, to have good character death, you need two essential elements. You need to really care about the character so that you feel the pain when they're dead. And then they have to be in a situation where death is a natural progression. 
And well, now, I think it depends on on why you're killing your characters, like how it relates to the story. Uh huh. Yeah, and some stories it doesn't need to be there, but they're just trying to set a tone that uh -huh. doesn't fit. Yeah, with Rogue One, it's basically a suicide mission. They're desperate. The rebels are desperate. That's a good thing they conveyed. The rebels are desperate. Yeah. And so they're going on this suicide mission to get these plans out to make it so that the bright, shining, happy New Hope film can exist. Uh -huh. And they're like, yeah, we're going to die, but we're going to... We're going to save the day doing it. Yeah, it's it's kind of changed the way I'm going to see A New Hope from now on. <laughs> <laughs> like, many Bothans died to get us these plans. <laughs> and Rogue One died, too. Yep. <laughs> yeah, where's the Bothans movie? Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> that needs to be a movie. That wasn't what I went, oh, about, but yeah. That needs to be a movie. The Bothans. <laughs> Why, well, that needs to be a meme on the internet. Bothans 2. <laughs> getting the Death Star 2 plans. <laughs> I saw a really great meme the other day. It was Gork the trash can droid said, yeah, he's just a trash can droid. And yeah, all he does is walk around. But you're going to watch it because it's a Star Wars film. <laughs> <laughs> so what did you say oh about? I was just thinking we need to talk about all the Easter eggs that are in. Oh, Rogue yeah. There's a fair amount. First one is super obvious. It's in like the first two minutes. It's the blue milk sitting on the counter. Oh, yeah. And the camera even lingers on it for an uncomfortable... <laughs> hey, Star Wars reference. <laughs> first movie. <laughs> um, the other one that I felt was just a little silly was when they ran into those two guys. <laughs> hey, we're wanted in 12 systems. You better watch yourself. And yeah, it wasn't just like they passed him. It's like they stop, they talk, and then they do two shots of them before they finally walk off. It's in like, a worse movie, I would have despised that. But in this one, <laughs> it works. It's like, that, that's, it's like, that's great. Look, person. it's those guys. <laughs> You're going to get your arm cut off here in like a week. <laughs> if the timeline of this is correct. Yeah. Um, other Easter eggs. They had the kyber crystals kind of expanding on the Jedi. Yeah, arc. this is, I think, was it one of you guys put it out? This is the first time the kyber crystals show up in a film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They've, anybody who's even touched a hint of the expanded universe in a video game, comic book, or a novel knows the importance of lightsaber crystals. So mm -hmm. that, that's, that's pretty good. For, for newcomers who are just either um, film initiated only or, oh, kind of getting into Star Wars for the first time, it's a good touch for them. Kind of expand on the lore of the universe. And explain how the Death Star works. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that was also a cool thing about this film, and it explained why the Death Star has such a fatal flaw. Well, a lot of people talked about that um, before the film came out. Like, this is the franchise's chance to kind of fix that plot hole. Uh huh. But it's not really a plot hole. Well, not anymore. It isn't. Nope. So yeah, what's her name's dad? Jin. Does, yeah. Jin's dad. Doctor the so. reactor so that if it got hit by anything, it would go critical and explode. For clarification yes. for the listeners. Mm -hmm. Hi, listeners. So, yeah, that was... I guess that's kind of an Easter egg, too, sort of, kind of. Um, you get a cameo from C-3PO and R2. That was a pretty good cameo. Actually, really, everything on Yavin 4. I liked it whenever they were at Yavin yeah, 4. Yeah, same. That was, that was fan service all the way, and I, yeah, I like, I'm not ashamed to admit I liked it all. All the, the establishing shots they had uh -huh. that were reminiscent. That poor guy up on the tower. <laughs> <laughs> He's always up there, and he watches them fly off like, come on, guys, that was our ship. <laughs> yeah, and they had all the, the rebel leaders there. Uh huh. They had Bell Organa there. Yeah. yeah. Talking about going back to Alderaan and meeting up with his Jedi friend. Alderaan. Actually, that was a really good bridge between the prequels and the original trilogy, I felt like. Oh, his, yeah. His character. Oh, yeah. Because he talks about Obi Wan and he talks about fighting in the Clone Wars. And it's all stuff that's mentioned in A New Hope, but it's all stuff we saw in the prequels. So it's a really good bridge and it almost redeems the prequels in a way because it's like it, it makes it gives you a little bit of endearment like i remember that i also remember it was kind of awkward but i remember it just remember the broad strokes plot points remember revenge of the sith yes oh yeah and then darth vader has his lava world prison lava yep. world <laughs> Yeah, that was a great way to introduce and bring guess, him into the movie. I think that's a thing in ex uh, expanded universe that he has a place on Mustafar. Yeah, he has a castle on Mustafar. That is a thing. Darth Vader was just awesome in this movie. So I like the way they portrayed Mustafar in this movie, kind of better than the way they did Revenge, Return of Revenge of the Sith. Return of the Sith. <laughs> Revenge of the Jedi. I right? am a what? Sith like my father before me. <laughs> Anakin, you don't have a father. You were conceived by the Force. The dark side of the force. <laughs> According to Mr. Plinkett, it's possible you were even c conceived by uh, Palpy. <laughs> Palpatine. 
willed you into existence. Well, in Darts and Droids, Dooku is his dad. I forgot about that. Yeah, I, for- I think that's right. When he chops his head off. No, wait, I'm your father! <laughs> <laughs> but we got off tangent. But yeah, Darth Vader. He, he was Darth really Vader good. Rocks. Oh, and you were talking about Mustafar in this movie. Well, yeah, that, I thought it, they did a good job with that yeah, setting. Yeah, it wasn't George Lucas's over CGI'd. Because we're going to have lava everywhere. Wa- lava waterfall. Well, yeah, this looked like an actual place. Honestly, it reminded me again of Iceland. Okay. I feel like their crew spent a lot of time in Iceland. Well, I mean, you're going to go to Iceland. Might as well get your money's worth. Yeah. Well, in Iceland, it's, it's one of those places that should be the whole Earth. <laughs> it's basically, it would be in Star Wars. There's a few places on Earth that look like alien worlds, and, and Iceland is one of them. But yes. anytime you see any like really cool photography of a, a bizarre landscape, you're like, that's probably Iceland. <laughs> and then southern Utah is Mars. All right, can I, uh, just a little tangent here. Can I just say they made space seem huge in this movie? With all the planets, all mm. the set pieces. Look at this empire base and this empire base. Well, that's something. It felt galaxy spanning. That's something George Lucas wanted to do with the prequels, actually. Okay. And maybe it was just I don't know executed better in this movie. Well, it was more compact in this movie. You saw a lot of worlds all at once. Uh huh. Whereas the the prequels, and this isn't really a fault of their own, just how the plot worked. You stayed on each planet for a long time. Well, and maybe that's a symptom of the differences between the films. Rogue One is an anthology film. It's a short story that happens in the Star Wars universe. The other films are supposed to be big, epic in size and scope. Yeah, Um, so I was saying that's not the fault of the prequels. Let's not unnecessarily dump on the prequels people. Yeah, the prequels in that regard they already have enough worth dumping on as it is. (laughs) We don't need to pile on top of that. Yeah, the prequels were just doing what the original trilogy already did and what the sequel trilogy is starting to do. Mm -hmm. And actually, I've talked to a couple of people who are almost disappointed. They're like, but Rogue One, it's supposed to be Star Wars. And I'm like, but it's an anthology film. But it is Star Wars. (laughs) It just reeks of Star Wars. It's oozing out of the sides. It is. It's just not as broad in scope. No. That's the difference, is scope it's and tone. Not, it's definitely a war film. Yeah. It's not an epic. Okay, so what did you think of the lack of the crawl in this one? Oh! So I, maybe, I was prepared going in. I read an yeah, article about... Yeah, I knew about that it wasn't going to be there. Two or three weeks beforehand, I read the article saying it's not going to be there. I was prepared to not be a complainer. <laughs> yes, and so... I don't think it needed it. Yeah, Cause again, it, scope. <laughs> yeah, and I was actually thinking about that, uh, that font they used for the Rogue One title when it came up. I was like, so we're going to get used to that font? Like, years for the down anthologies. the road? Like, all the anthologies, that's going to be standard Star Wars? Oh. <laughs> Because this one's setting the mold. Yeah. Well, yeah, Disney's doing with Star Wars what they've already done with Marvel. And say what you will about what they've done with Marvel, but it was a good test case. And I think... And it's been pretty successful for them. It's been successful. There's A lot of their movies are really enjoyable, and the way they bring them together is enjoyable. If they do the same thing with Star Wars, there's nothing to be worried about. Mm -hmm. And honestly, because of the prequels, there's a lot riding on them to put some effort into it. Yeah. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. The very and, same. And if they, if we ever get to that point, fool me twice, then they're toast. There goes the whole Star Wars franchise. <laughs> well, I don't know if anyone will ever make the mistake of the prequels ever again. Uh, they're kind of hardened against it now. They'll go in the opposite to the most extreme, but they'll never make them prequels again. Now, do you mean that in a broader sense or just in a Star Wars sense? Because in a Star Wars sense, I absolutely agree with you. But in a broader sense, I never, ever underestimate the stupidity of Hollywood executives. I agree with you there. I see so many stupid films every year. And it's like, you guys never learn, but Star Wars is learning. And that's all that matters. It's learning. It's evolving. (laughs) Well, there's a lot riding on it. See, now the really exciting point is where we're at now, we get about two to three Marvel films a year. And the way it looks, it's going to be about one Star Wars film a year. Could we up the ante? (laughs) (laughs) I kind of hope they don't do that. You don't want to wear off the novelty of it. (laughs) I just had to push that out there to the extreme. Like, come well, on, I mean, guys, let's not let's like, not like go overboard with this. Bringing it back to quintessence, one one factor that increases the quintessence of a movie or a, a property, a piece of media, is the inaccessibility of it. This is true. And so, if they went out of control with updates, it would get boring really fast. 
even if it was new stuff, you'd start to get Star Wars fatigue, mm -hmm. which it's kind of amazing that we haven't at this point already. <laughs> Star Wars. Well, the thing about there Star Wars. There was a long gap between the prequels and seven. Yeah, that's well, true. Well, and the prequels in the original trilogy. As it is right now, Star Wars is still a fairly rare commodity. Let's see. Revenge of the Sith came out in 2005. That's been almost 12 years ago. In 12 years, we've only had two new movies. Yeah, that's true. So they're not nearly as in danger as they are with the Marvel franchise. A lot of what I judge movies based on is my own subjective experience. So it's kind of hard to judge crowds that way. For example, I don't know if I have Marvel fatigue yet, but maybe audiences do. I don't know if you've gotten that vibe yet that there's people that... I don't... I haven't. I don't think so, no. I think people I think are our still parents invested. have. Well, I imagine their demographic does have Marvel fatigue, but the marketing team doesn't care. They have the target market, and as long as they don't have Marvel fatigue, it doesn't matter. Although I will say this, that it's definitely a bit more rare when a Marvel movie comes out that I would want to buy. But this Rogue One is definitely one I would want to purchase. So I'm, I'm saying a, it's a bit of a level above those. Well, that's going back to our subjective experience. It's all about what drives us and emotes us to make a purchase like that. And in a case like that, that's something that really reached us. Whereas, in a more general sense, Marvel fatigue is not an issue, even if we don't want to buy all the Yeah, I guess, I guess we would want to keep watching them in theaters, or, or at the very worst, on Netflix, or whatever they the mail service is called these days. You're not in that demographic yet, Robert. No, no, no. Netflix <laughs> is the streaming thing, and they changed the name of the videos in the mail part of it. Oh, they just did that? Fairly recently. It's different on the on the envelopes. What is really? it called? Um, I don't Block remember. Blockbuster. <laughs> <laughs> what is this blockbuster you speak of? Well, you see, when Star Wars first came out, the line was all the way past the block, and that's the blockbuster. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's where the blockbuster comes from. Well, it looks like we're... Uh, running close to a half hour now but that's before the editing's down but that's still before a we kind edit of out all the secret things that are boring to listen secret, to secret secret i've got a secret so uh one thing we we mentioned briefly but we haven't gone into yet is darth vader darth vader what are you doing to stop darth vader <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to say about darth vader that we Just haven't that said already was really really awesome especially that scene at the end <laughs> where they're standing in the dark hallway and the lightsaber <laughs> turns on <laughs> and you're like you're all dead <laughs> the guy's pounding at the door it's like run that was actually a really good contrast because in the original trilogy darth vader is almost more subdued but that's because he does it on purpose. His fight with Luke in The Empire Strikes Back is that way because he's just roughing him up to get him carbonated. If you actually wanted to slice into pieces, he could have done it in a minute flat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which is a big deal when Luke bests him in Return of the Jedi. Uh-huh. So yeah, seeing him do what he did in uh, Rogue One was spot on. It was perfect for the tone and everything. And it was just awesome seeing and it, Darth Vader really Darth thing about up the Darth Vader character for A New Hope. Yeah. Like, you understand why he's this feared character. <laughs> yeah, it makes him a lot scarier. And uh, they handled him really well. He he just was the dark side. <laughs> he, he didn't have any whiny motivations or anything like in Revenge of the Sith, where he, he kills he everyone and this... then he goes out to cry. Yeah, you've got the antagonists, you've got the director and Tarkin, and then you've got this really evil guy that's there along for the ride doing evil things. And he works for Tarkin. Uh-huh. He's kind of like this wild animal that they <laughs> unleash on their enemies they hate the most. Mm-hmm. And he, he takes care of business. He defeats the rebel fleet. He almost gets the... There's well, he does. Yeah. He does get. He does get. Um, what do they call it? Tentative. The oh yeah, the tentative. Basically, the blockade runner. Yeah. He gets the blockade runner in the next film. Kills pretty much all the rebels except for a handful they take prisoner, and then he's gonna interrogate and kill Princess Leia. So yeah, this is I think the Darth Vader that people wanted in the prequels. Maybe. Uh -huh. It is. You didn't really get a Darth Vader in the prequels because, well, the simple fact of it is he was Anakin too much of the time. And then at the end, you have a fight with Obi-Wan, he kills a few Separatists, and then he puts on the suit. That's practically as much as you can do for the, the story he's telling there. Mm -hmm. So in this one, you got to actually just have more Darth Vader being Darth Vader. And who knows, maybe we'll get some more of that in some other anthology films. Well, let's just do a, an anthology film about Darth Vader going around killing people. <laughs> yeah, can we do one <laughs> that's about the... It'll be around the same time period as Rogue One, maybe like five years earlier. 
when the Empire is we'll in just charge. Call it Darth Vader kills everyone. <laughs> and the sequel will have Liam Neeson in it, also <laughs> killing everyone. Well, see, Liam Neeson is a Jedi. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh my. <laughs> no, he faked his death because he was going to the dark side. And so the movie is about him teaming up with Darth Vader and they're going to take out the Sith. But then he has to sacrifice himself at the end. I didn't realize this before, but apparently that nod at the end of Revenge of the Sith where Yoda tells Obi-Wan he's going to commune with Qui-Gon, that was how Obi-Wan learned to force die at the end of A New Hope when okay. Darth Vader goes to strike him down. And that actually makes a lot more sense now because he was, he was yeah. learning from Qui-Gon all those years. Yeah, that was the whole point of that exchange. I've, I've been talking to Qui-Gon, Qui-Gon Ghost, who's going to be in the second movie, but he broke his leg. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Didn't know ghosts could do that. <laughs> oh, it's a real problem in the spirit world. <laughs> the netherworld of the force, as they call it. See, what happens is um, sometimes they get run, run, jump. Run, 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 jump. I can be a backpack while uh -huh. you run. <laughs> and then they fall and break their leg. <laughs> oh, yeah. Happens every time. We've just spent an entire London show geeking out about Star Wars, so... No, that's perfect. Yeah. We could probably go on for a while longer. <laughs> we should uh, We should probably end the commercial. <laughs> so I'll just end the commercial. <laughs> Inside joke. Inside joke. <laughs> but maybe not forever. All right. Happy Life Day. <laughs> Yay. Holy smokes!